Our Old Testament passage this morning comes from the book of 2 Kings. We'll be reading the first two verses and then continuing with verses 6 through 14. It can be found on page 291 of your pew Bible if you would like to follow along or if you have with you your own Bible or a Bible app on your phone and would like to follow along there, please feel free to do so. But let us attend to God's word for us on this Lord today. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. And then continuing at verse six, then Elijah said to him, stay here, the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he replied, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Fifty men from the company of prophets went and stood at a distance, facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise it will not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his garment and tore it in two. Elisha then picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. When he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. This is the word of God for the people of God. Would you please pray with me? Gracious God, Shower your spirit upon us. Interpose your spirit between us that the words I speak may be filtered through your spirit that only what is from you might be heard and take root so that you would be glorified and we would be changed in Christ our Lord. Amen. So last week we talked about Elijah. We talked about Elijah as he was fleeing from Jezebel as he was fleeing in fear and was on the mountain, on Mount Horeb, which is also Mount Sinai. And there on the mountain, God said, I'll pass by. And Elijah was paying attention and there was a great, uh, a great wind and God wasn't in the wind and there was a great fire and God wasn't in the fire and there was a great earthquake and God wasn't in the earthquake but God was in the still, small voice, the quiet whisper that Elijah heard and knew then that that God really was with him. And then God told him, go back the way you've come. Go back because you're not done yet. I'm putting you back in the game. And he sent him down to Aram to to anoint Haziel as king. And he sent him to anoint a man to be a prophet, a successor for him, a man named Elisha. And Elijah found Elisha in a field as as Elisha was plowing the field, leading, you know, guiding a, a yoke of oxen for the planting. And Elijah came up and threw his cloak, his mantle, over the shoulders of Elisha. 
a way of, of claiming him, of telling him, you're going to be my, my follower. I'm going to mentor you and teach you what it is to follow in the ways of the Lord, to be a prophet for God. And then after a lot of other things happen that we're not talking about this morning, we get to our passage that we just read. Where now Elijah is about to be taken up. He is about to be called home by God, and he knows it. And so as he and Elisha are, are traveling, he tells Elisha, stay here. But Elisha refuses. Elisha says, no, I am going with you. And Elijah takes his, his mantle, his cloak, and uses it to, to strike the waters, and they part. And then they get to the other side, and this, this well-known passage with the, the chariots of fire and the horses of fire separating Elijah from Elisha. And Elijah's taken up in a whirlwind. It's something we're not as familiar with living here in Michigan. Right? But, you know, if you spent time in Iowa, as uh, my family and I did, you know, that doesn't sound so far-fetched, right? Um, a whirlwind that can, can take somebody right up to heaven. And Elisha then realizes that his mentor, his teacher, is gone. That he will not see him again in this life. And so he tears his clothes. That was a, back in... Back in biblical times, people did that. If they were really upset, they'd tear their clothes, right? Don't do that or your folks will get really upset, right? <laughs> then they'll tear their clothes. Okay. But back then, that's, how, that's one of the ways you show grief was to, to rend your garments. But then he saw Elijah's cloak where it had fallen, and he takes it up. He picks up Elijah's mantle, because he is now there to carry on on his own. And he says, okay, God, where are you? And he strikes the water and it parts and he knows that God is with him as God was with Elijah. Just as he had asked. Yeah. Here is, as Elijah is heading away, okay, he asks him, you know, Elijah says, what can I give you? Do you guys ever experience that? Have you ever had, like, your parents go away and, and they're going on a trip and you want them to give you something so that you'll, you'll be thinking about them when they're gone? Okay. Elisha says to Elijah, give me a double portion of your spirit. And that may sound a little, I don't know, graspy. Um, like, you know, Elisha says, hey, I want even more than you've got. Right? But, but Elisha here is saying two things. One, I think he's saying... I'm not you, Elijah. I can't do this on my own. You're going away. I'm going to need God with me even more than he was with you. He recognizes his need for God's guidance and presence with him. But I think he's also asking Elijah to help him have that sense of identity because the double portion is what went to the eldest son. If you read in, in the Torah, okay, in the Old Testament, when a man died, his inheritance went to his sons, okay, now to all the children, but back then it was just to sons. Okay. And the first son got a double portion. Okay. And so Elisha is asking Elijah, let me know that you've really adopted me, that I'm really your, your son in a way that is meaningful. And he sees that that's the truth as he asks, where is the God of Elijah? And the waters part for him. And he goes on to do the ministry of a prophet and he does amazing, wonderful things. And, and you should read 2 Kings and see some of the things that he does. But the thing about Elisha is that he needed someone to guide him. He needed Elijah to, to show him the ropes to teach him how to do what he was called to do. He needed a mentor. And he's not the only one. 
We all need mentors. We all need somebody to, to help us see the way, to help us learn the faith and, and figure out how to live this life that we're called to. I was reading earlier this week about, um, well, about elephants. Uh, I was reading about a, uh, some elephants in, in uh, South Africa. It was a story about a, a wildlife preserve. And in this wildlife preserve, the, uh, you know, the keepers were very concerned because 39 rhinos, rare white rhinos, had been killed. But it wasn't poachers. Eh? It was juvenile delinquent elephants that had killed these poor rhinos. And what had happened about 10 years previous to that, the park was getting overcrowded with, with elephants. So they decided they needed to cull the herd. And they decided the way to do that would be to kill the older elephants whose offspring were old enough to take care of themselves. And so that's what they did. Now, this was about 30 years ago, right? So um, I think procedures have changed by now. But that's, that's the approach they took. And so these young elephants grew up without a father, without somebody to mentor them. And what happened was that they, uh, they started roaming around in, in gangs, these young bull elephants. They, they roamed around in gangs and began to do things that, that elephants don't normally do. At the watering hole, they'd throw sticks at the rhinos and throw water at them. Right? And then because there were no mature males, no uh, you know, large bull males, these young males became uh, sexually active early and they had extra testosterone for what they should have and they became aggressive. And so a few of the young males, they started becoming especially violent. They'd knock over the rhinos and they would kneel on them or, or press down on them with their feet and crush them. And one of the gang leaders eventually had to be killed because he'd become so violent. So what they did, realizing what was going on, they brought in a mature male elephant who then uh, came in to, to establish dominance within the herd and to put those young bulls in their places. Right? He went in and, and mentored them and the killing stopped. You might say he took these, these, these bullies and helped them become real bulls. But we need mentors just, just like these elephants did. You see, we often think we know what we're doing and are clever enough to figure it out on our own. But in the Proverbs, we're told there is a way that seems right to a person, but in the end, it leads to death. Our faith is not meant to be something we figure out all on our own. We need mentors. We need others to help us understand what's this about and how do I live it? How do I be a Christian in a world that is not? How do I find the, the courage to live in, a, in what is often a difficult situation? How do I know the right thing to do in different situations? And we need someone to lead us. I don't know about you, but, but for me, you know, my first real mentors in the faith were my folks. My parents helped me to learn about the faith and to, to see how to live it as they tried to live it out themselves. Other mentors may have been you know, youth group leaders or, or Sunday school teachers. Some of, of my mentors have been people that I never actually got to meet in person, uh, but they mentored me through the things they wrote. Yeah. Eugene Peterson, who died a couple of years ago, uh, was a prolific writer and more, wrote wonderful stuff helping pastors to understand what it means to be a pastor and the challenges and the encouragements that are in that. Yeah. We all need mentors. And that's true whether we're just starting out in the faith or whether we've been at it for a while, right? We need someone who's down the road who can help guide us and encourage us and correct us if necessary. And if you don't have a mentor, 
I encourage you just to pray for one. Okay? God will bring you someone to help you in this walk. We need a mentor just as Elisha did. Okay? But notice that at the end, Elisha picks up the mantle. Okay? He takes Elijah's cloak and goes on because the faith is not something that we need a mentor in only. We also need to be mentors to others. We need to pass it on. Yeah. We need to take responsibility to, to take our experience, what we've learned, what we have done, and to pass that on to others. The mistakes we've made, the successes we've had. Yeah. All of us are called to take up that mantle. Yeah. In a little bit here, we're going to, we're going to have a baptism. Yeah. And little, little Landon, who you may have just heard, okay, Landon is going, going to be baptized. And you all are going to make some promises. You're going to make promises on behalf of the universal church to help raise her in the faith. Yeah. Every time there's a baptism, we make promises to help this person grow in the faith. Which means every one of you, at some point, people promised to help you grow in the faith. Yeah. But what we're promising to do is, is to be mentors. As, as parents, we are promising to raise a child in the faith. Yeah. As family, we're promising to help guide them. Yeah. As members of a congregation, we're saying we're going to help those who are coming up in the faith. And we have opportunities to mentor. Yeah. As I mentioned, next week we're heading off on a mission trip, you know, a week from tomorrow. Right? And maybe the next time around, you'll feel called to, to be involved in that and to mentor some young people who are learning their faith. Yeah. Maybe you'll, you'll be called to mentor in our midweek programs as we have elementary kids come in during the Wednesday evenings. Yeah. Or in Sunday school. Okay. Or leading a, a Bible study or just getting involved. Yeah. Mentoring can be getting to know your neighbors and helping them not only to learn the faith here, yeah, but to see the way you live it, so that they too begin to understand what it means to be a Christian. We all need mentors, and we're all called to be mentors, to have the mantle put over our shoulders, but also to take it up, because that's the way the faith goes on. You've probably all heard the idea that, you know, that the church is only one generation away from not existing anymore. And we are the ones